Hi, I'm Michael Feldstein. And I'm Phil Hill. And welcome back to eLiterate TV. Today we're going to be talking about online learning. This is a topic that's captured the public's imagination recently as famous columnists like New York Times writers Tom Friedman and David Brooks have written articles about massively open online courses from elite uh, institutions. But really, online learning has been around for quite a while. And it just hasn't been in the public eye because it hasn't been glamorous. 20, 30 years ago, we had uh, community colleges and, and other uh, schools that were trying to serve the needs of underserved populations, employing online education for the purpose of achieving mission-related access. Mm. Uh, as those programs matured and people began to see that they could scale, uh, other institutions started to get into the game and started to ask the question about whether this is a possible revenue generator for them. And then as these programs matured further and the financial landscape changed for higher education, we began to see more and more institutions asking whether they could be a money saver. Now we're in an environment where uh, we're seeing many different models being pursued for a number of different academic aims. Phil, you did a great job recently, I thought, in your Educause uh, article uh, framing the issues and, and the various models that are available to people. And in particular, you have a graphic that really began to lay out the landscape for folks. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, sure. And part of the motivation for doing that graphic in the first place is that with the popular discussion you're referring to, media narratives tend to be simple. So you had online education or face-to-face -face education. Right. And a lot of these articles just keep talking as if there's this dichotomy and there are only two things. Well, as it turns out, there's a rich landscape of educational delivery models that go well beyond just face-to-face -face or online. So this graphic actually calls out one way to view the different models. And on the horizontal axis, you could think of this in terms of how online is the course. You can look all the way to the left and say, this is your traditional face-to-face. -face. You could have partially face-to-face, -face, partially online. And then you get up to, well, what if it's a traditional program, but just an individual course is online? And then you start thinking, well, what if it's a fully online program? And even further, what if it's not just online, but it's actually self-paced where every student works at their own pace? That is more of a spectrum that lays out this landscape. And then if you look at the other axis vertically, it turns out one of the biggest differentiators of the programs and of the models that come through is how the core element, the course, is actually designed. Now, we're all familiar that with the traditional model, an individual faculty designs a course, but occasionally you get into a faculty team designing a course. And then going further up, there's a pretty big change where you're saying, well, what if it's an actual, an entire team designing a course where a faculty member is one of the members? There could be instructional designers, multimedia experts, subject matter experts, and the faculty all working together to design a course. So laying it out, with those two dimensions, you get a landscape of models. And there's quite a few that you'll notice are in here. We've talked about the MOOCs and how this is a new model that captured the imagination of the public. Now, I'd like to call out one other key point. You'll notice, obviously, the barrier, which you've referred to before. This is a cultural barrier, and it represents the fact that it turns out it's very difficult for a traditional college or university to move into a team-based course design. It tends to go against what their DNA is, their assumption of faculty role. Yet it's this crossing the barrier that leads to some of the models that we've been seeing recently. So that's really the rationale and how to view a landscape to get a better feeling. Yeah, I think the point about the wall is really critical for colleges and universities to understand, especially as we enter this period where more and more schools are starting to build programs online wholesale, and they're bringing in third-party vendors to help yes. them. Right. So a lot of, even though it's a small area of the graph, the upper right-hand corner is where a lot of the action is, sure. is happening right now. And there are many different models that these providers bring on. They're essentially uh, outsourcing different parts of the work 
of running an online school, and some of that might be enrollment and marketing, but some of it could be course design. And 90% of the time when you hear about a controversy of one of these deals, it has to do with the degree to which faculty autonomy and faculty authority to say how a course should be designed is being impinged upon because of the, re the business relationship that's being developed. So that raises a good point. It's not just the team-based course design, but when you add outsourcing to that, it erases a whole new dimension that people need to deal with. And recently in California, a lot of people have heard about the state legislature and the governor have both been working on initiatives to deal with online courses. And that actual nature of outsourcing the course design created a lot of the blowback that we saw. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that situation? Yeah, so it was a little bit of a mess, actually. On the good side, California state legislature and the governor uh, came with a very serious and important issue and a focused issue to which they could apply educational yes. technology, There's specifically bottleneck courses. Let's say you're a senior in college, you're going to some Cal State or UC uh, school, and you get to your last semester, you've taken all the courses you need to take, you're, you've got enough credits to graduate, all you need is that one calculus course. Only problem is that calculus course is full. So what happens? Well, what happens is you stay another year to complete that calculus course. And because you need financial aid, you don't just take one course, you take a full load because that's the only way you get financial aid. So it costs you, you incur debt, the state and federal governments pay extra financial aid, and another student who could be in your spot it doesn't get in. So it's a really good issue. The problem is that the, the solution that was proposed originally by the state legislature was we'll bring in these third party companies and they will offer courses to solve the problem and then schools will give credit. Well, academic uh, senates were not that happy about that on, on these campuses. So the 20 Million Minds Foundation brought us in uh, to write a white paper and make a proposal. And after thinking about it some, it became clear that there are a number of different levels that you can address this problem. Mm -hmm. right, first, we have to acknowledge that there are non-technological solutions to the bottleneck course problem. Yes. Right? You could increase the number of faculty. You could um, change the ratio of courses taught by existing faculty between lower division and upper division courses. Right? There are lots of different solutions. One size does not fit all. Then even within the realm of educational technology, there, there are a number of options you could apply. One is to use educational technology not to do online learning, but to expand the size of addition of current face-to-face -face classes. Sure. Right? So you could use adaptive software, for example, to help tutor students and uh, grow the size of the class, or you could do a blended class where students only have physical seat time in a lecture hall one day a week if, for example, the reason you have a bottleneck course is because you don't have enough physical space for the number of students you have. Sure. The next level would be either the university, the college or university itself, or maybe the system, the Cal State system, the UC system, the California Community Colleges system, offer on fully online courses. Which they already do, of course. They already do. Um, they're not necessarily targeted at this problem, which is right, which is something that um, we try to emphasize when we have conversations with schools about this, right? You really need to make sure that whatever online program you're running is actually designed to solve the problem that you're trying to solve, sure. right? So it would be possible for a student at Cal State Northridge trying to get their course to take a, a calculus course online from Cal State Northridge or maybe from another Cal State campus and satisfy the requirement that way. And then, if you've exhausted all those other possibilities, then you can begin talking about what we call the safety valve, yes. which was a, a third party provider that could come in and enable students to take courses in your calculus, for example, um, and get credit at any university. So there are, there are a number of different ways that you can approach this technologically and non-technologically. And the key really is to look at the problem you're solving in the context of the particular college or university, what they have in terms of their strengths and resources and what they're missing, and then figure out what's the best match between the problem and the solution. And part of that match, uh, for example, what we were trying to recommend to the white paper is there's not just a single match. We actually believe okay. that there were several models could, uh, that could work together to achieve the same goal. Yeah. 
So bottleneck courses are a really good example of a problem that a university or, or even a system or state might try to solve. But of course, there are others. Uh, you could be a rural community college trying to serve students who are far from campus and, and can't possibly get f there for face-to-face. -face. Or you could be trying to raise revenue by reaching students in, in places that are across a state line or across a country line. Chances are on your campus you have some online course or program or other. It might be big, it might be small, it could be a fully online degree program, or it could be an individual faculty member teaching one course. Whatever it is, we'd like you to think a little bit about what purpose it was designed for and whether it's fulfilling that purpose. So let's start the conversation together about aligning our goals with our programs. Take a moment for us, please, and tell us a little bit about your online initiative on your campus, what goal it serves, and how it might be tuned to serve that goal better.